a beauty queen, a school teacher, a great life. But something unexpected happened, something her family and her friends never saw coming. Did she walk away from her seemingly perfect life? Or did someone step in and change everything completely? Where was Tara? What really happened? And would she ever be found? Of course, we've got a lot of questions. It has just now opened another chapter in the story. Our wounds are deep and our hearts are broken. The shocking story of Tara Grimstead. Before we begin, we would like to send our deepest sympathies to the loved ones of Tara Grinstead, who fell victim to the abominable acts described in this case. Tara Grinstead was a teacher, a former beauty queen, and a mentor to young girls headed towards the world of pageantry. She earned her master's degree in education from the University at Valdosta State and also planned on pursuing her doctorate. But on October the 22nd, 2005, her world would change irrevocably. Tara was born on November the 14th, 1974 to Bill and Faye Grinstead. She grew up in Hawkinsville, Georgia, along with her older sister, Anita. Their parents would eventually divorce and Bill would later marry a lady by the name of Connie Cox. Tara grew close to her stepmother. Tara was a petite beauty from day one, which eventually paved the way to her winning the title of Miss Tifton in 1999, then moving on towards the Miss Georgia beauty pageant. She graduated from Middle Georgia College and moved to Osceola and was hired as a history teacher at Irwin County High School. Osceola is a small two-traffic light town in South Georgia. It has the charm and quiet of the South that draws people to the area. A pleasant and heartwarming place that many love to call home. A population of around 3,600 and very well known for its annual sweet potato festival. It includes a sweet potato parade, a sweet potato dish sampling, and of course, the Miss Sweet Potato pageant. Also, an abundance of beautiful pecan orchards there, one of the largest being the Hudson Pecan Company with over 2,200 acres of good old Southern Georgia pecans. Tara had a great life ahead of her and a bucket list full of goals and dreams. She taught during the day, then at night she was taking classes towards the doctoral program. One of her aspirations was being a principal one day. But the world changed on October 22, 2005, forever. On that day, Tara had been helping the girls that were contestants in the Miss Sweet Potato pageant. Later, she went on to a neighborhood cookout at Dr. Troy Davis's residence with others in attendance that evening. Around 11 p.m., she told everyone good night and headed home. To note, Tara had told Dr. Davis that she was planning on watching a video of the pageant from earlier that day, but that videotape was never found. It would be the last time she would ever be seen or heard from again. Two days later, on October the 24th, 2005, Tara didn't show up for work at the high school. Worried co-workers called police to do a wellness check at Tara's home. When they arrived, they found no forced entry to the residence and Tara was nowhere to be found. They did find an alarm clock that was laying on the floor with the time being off about six hours. Her cell phone was plugged in where it always was. A broken lamp was propped up on the nightstand and a broken necklace lay on the floor. All that was missing from the residence was her purse and keys. Her pearl white Mitsubishi 3000 GT was parked in the carport with the doors unlocked and $100 in cash in an envelope laying on the dash. Two things Tara didn't do was leave her money lying around or leave her car unlocked. Also, the driver's seat had been moved back from the steering wheel, too far back for such a petite woman to be able to drive. Officers also noticed dried mud on the tires of the otherwise clean vehicle. A neighbor stated they had come home around 1.30 a.m. Sunday morning and Tara's carport had been empty. Then, later on, the car was back. Two separate witnesses say they saw a black truck parked in Tara's driveway or yard. One witness said there had been someone sitting in the truck. They believed it was a man. 
The time frames were Sunday around 6 a.m., 7.30 p.m., and 12 a.m. Monday morning. Who owned the black truck, and could that black truck have had something to do with Tara's disappearance? A mysterious phone number was found when her cell phone had been gone through by investigators. A call from a payphone blocks from Tara's home had come in. No message was left. Investigators would look much more closely at that. There had been no activity on her credit cards and no money was missing from her checking account, yet money had been haphazardly left in her car. Investigators went over the home and property again. No forced entry and no signs of struggle, but the bedroom was cluttered and the bed unmade. I saw what I thought was suspected blood on the underside of that white comforter, Jeff Rosler, a GBI special agent in charge, said. Testing later showed that there was uncertainty on whether it was true blood or menstrual blood. A latex glove was found in the yard near the front of the house, and there had been a business card shoved into the crack of the front door. Later, the glove would be tested, having not only Tara's DNA on it, but also DNA from an unknown male. As for the business card in the door, it was from Heath Dykes, who was a captain at Perry PD in a bordering county. He was allegedly a friend of the family and had been called to check on Tara. There had also been 20 calls with messages from Mr. Dykes left on Tara's answering machine that Sunday evening before he went to her residence around midnight. He knocked on the front door several times but was never able to get Tara to come to the door. Tara's beloved pets, a German shepherd named Dolly Madison, had been left outside in the fenced backyard, and a cat named Herman Talmadge was inside the home. Later on, a friend would tell the officer that Tara never left her pets unattended for long periods of time. Osceola Police Chief Billy Hancock had also reported to the residents and later stated, It just never felt right. It felt like something was just wrong. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation was called in to help. Due to the small town's limited police resources, they would need more help for a case of this magnitude. Town members, family, and friends came together to aid in looking for Tara over the next couple of weeks. They would hold vigils. A $100,000 reward was offered for information. They would put up flyers and create community groups to aid in searches on foot, by ATV, and on horseback. Any way they could help to find one of their own, they were going to do it. There was a 34-hour window from the last time Tara was seen to when officers did the welfare check on Monday morning. The first 48 hours are crucial, but with each hour that passes, it can lower the chances of finding the victim alive. The clock was ticking. Tara had a long-standing boyfriend by the name of Marcus Harper, a former officer with the Osceola Police Department who had joined the Army Rangers and was overseas often. They had been seeing each other for six years, and Tara had hopes that they would eventually marry one day. But in the fall of 2005, the relationship ended. Tara had wanted much more, but Marcus was not ready to settle down. He wanted to see the world, and marriage just wasn't for him at that time. Tara was devastated by the ending of the relationship, but the two would stay in touch. Tara would do things such as sending an odd email to Marcus's mother, cloaked in less than favorable words. When Tara had gone missing, one theory was that she had just walked away from the drama in her life and the dissolving of her relationship with Marcus. This, in turn, put him in the limelight for possibly being a suspect in her disappearance. Marcus was called in to be interviewed by investigators. He was willing and cooperative with them, plus he had an alibi for the night Tara went missing. After Marcus Harper arrived back in town from an overseas job, he decided to visit with his former fellow officers and do a ride-along with his former PD partner, Sean Fletcher, who was working the night shift. They traveled the county until the early morning hours of Sunday. With Marcus seemingly off the hook, Tara's love life was more closely examined. Were there other men in her life? A 20-year-old former student named Anthony Vickers came to mind. Vickers had tried to break into Tara's home. 
He was arrested and issued a restraining order. He seemed to have an obsession for her. The Vickers would claim the two of them had been seeing each other for a couple of years and the relationship was of a sexual nature. No one could ask Tara to deny or verify the statement. So was it the truth or a made-up story by a jealous young man? Rhett Roberts and Tara had worked at the same school. He lived just a few blocks away from her. The two of them went out a few times during the spring and summer before she went missing. Roberts also happened to be the son of Tara's landlord. Did you know Tara Princeton at the same Yes. And how did you know Miss Princeton? Uh, we met as co-workers, as both being teachers at the school, and uh, we met on a few dates. It was the spring and uh, a little bit of the summer before she went missing. Do you recall whether or not you saw Miss Brinstead on October 27, 2005, or not on October 27? Uh, yes. Uh, no, therefore, were you at the sweet table? I was not at the sweet table. Where were you located when you saw Miss Brinstead that evening? I was at my home, um, just going out and watching college football games. Uh, grilling, just grilling out. Okay. Was anyone else at the present last week? No. How did, uh, did you know that Mr. Prince was going to stop by when she got there? I didn't know. When she got there, did she call ahead of time, or did she come out the door? Tell us what happened at that point. Uh, I was inside at the time, and I just heard a knock on the door, and when I opened it, it was her. Uh, did Mr. Prince have come into your home? She did not. Probably around five to ten minutes. And during that time, when you and she speak? Yes. Where were you located in the conversation? I stepped outside of, uh, of the front of the house and we had a conversation out there. Do you recall about the time of night when she came back? Um, it was, I was watching college football and it was like, Half time of, of one of the games, so it was around 8 30 or so. Was it uh, dark outside? I think it had just gotten dark. Are you familiar with the residents of the Springsteen Club? Uh, yes. How are you familiar with the residents of the Springsteen Club? Uh, actually, my father went over the house. Then there was her brother in law, Larry Gattis. There had been plenty of rumors about a possible affair, which was never confirmed. A polygraph test that he took during the investigation showed that he may have been deceptive in answering at least one question. Then there was Heath Dykes, the married police officer from nearby Perry, Georgia, who had left his card in the door and all of those messages on her answering machine. It was rumored that he was having an affair with Tara. Allegedly, this affair occurred in 2004-2005 when Dykes was still married. Those close to her knew that Tara was not the type of woman that just slept around. Besides, she was young and single, and she deserved a love life just like anyone else. Everyone knows there has always been the double standard when it came to men. They could see as many women as they wanted and nothing would ever be said. It was a conquest and a slap on the back for men. Women, on the other hand, would be labeled loose or a whore if they saw more than one man at a time and certainly ostracized by others. Plus, living in a small town, there will be talk and rumors can fly rampant regardless of whether a person is in the wrong or not. Everyone knows everyone else's business, and judgment can be passed swiftly. What mattered, though, was a young woman had gone missing as if she had just vanished off the face of the earth. Someone they all knew had disappeared. Regardless of who she had been involved with or what she may or may not have done, she needed to be found. But days turned into weeks, with hundreds of leads coming in, but none ever turning into anything solid. No person of interest was found, no suspect materialized. It would be the year of 2017 that the case would erupt into a world of lies, deceit, and hidden agendas.
In July of 2008, some activity caused a mix of concern and possible hope for some answers. A documentary was created on Tara's disappearance, and there had been a chance that it was related to another missing young woman. Jennifer Kessie from Florida had gone missing within just a few months of Tara and in a remarkably similar way. But eventually, it was concluded that while similar, the cases were not connected. 2008 was a sad year. Tara hadn't been found, no connections made, no new evidence came to light, and sadly, Tara's mother passed away. She would never know what happened to her youngest daughter. We were almost inside. Watching her suffer like she suffered and imagining all the horrible things that could have happened to Tara. Her life was just total hell during that time. And she would not leave her house at least might have been the first few months because she was afraid Tara would call her. And she wanted, she knew that if Tara was being held or whatever and she could get away, that Faye would be the one that she would call. And she would not leave her house for anything during that time. She would talk to me a lot, mainly about where could Tara be? What had happened to her? Who would have done something like that? And we watched one, I remember, of Tara and some guy at the school performing in the gym not too long before that happened. And listening to Tara sing, they were both singing or something. And she was so good. But Faye would just sit there and go over all that, and just back over it. Another hard hit to the family occurred in 2010 when Tara was declared dead in absentia, which is the legal status for a person missing for five years and longer. The order was signed by a judge in Irwin County, Georgia. In 2011, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation confirmed that they were still investigating the Tara Grinstead case. Many thought that the ball had been dropped and Tara's case had just been moved to a back burner. Year after year passed by with no arrests. It would be 2017 before a suspect or suspects would be found. Or would it? Back in 2005, after the disappearance of Tara Grinstead, two former students of hers were at a party bragging to friends that they had killed Tara, then burned the body. This was reported to police according to court documents that were filed in the Superior Court of Irwin County. Why had this been ignored or pushed to the side? Did investigators not feel there was enough tangible evidence to act? Also, another person, John McCullough, had been in basic training for the Army with an individual who, while they were on leave, allegedly had drunkenly confessed to him what had happened to Tara Grinstead. John had been invited to come to Georgia with this individual, and John accepted. When they passed by a huge billboard with a photo of Tara on it, the individual started talking and claiming that they had known what happened to Tara. McCulloch reported what he had heard to several different law enforcement agencies in 2007, but no one would call him back. Finally, John McCulloch was contacted in 2016 by GBI investigator Jason Schaudel, 11 years later. In 2017, a woman named Brooke Sheridan had come forward with some alarming information for the GBI. Information she learned through her boyfriend, Bo Dukes. He said that a friend of his, Ryan Duke, no relation, took him into confidence and told him he had killed Tara Grinstead back in 2005. So what occurs on January 10th of 2017 that you learn that your boyfriend, in fact, had helped dispose of her body? Um, I'm not, I don't recall the exact events that led up to it. 
but I do know that he had had a severe panic attack, um, and he, you know, after I got him calm, he, um, I told him that he needed to tell me what was going on, and he proceeded to tell me what had happened. Okay. What did he tell you? He told me about his, that his roommate had gone into her home, had strangled her, and that he had put her body on, or he had taken his truck and put her body on um, the Hudson property in Fitzgerald, and that he helped to destroy the body. When you told them what you knew um, about this lie that Fove had been keeping for all these years, um, was any decision made? Yes. And what was that decision? Um, to contact the GBI. Okay. Um, my mother um, contacted her friend, uh, a friend of hers from high school, Mr. Tim Vaughn, to see if I needed to seek legal counsel because I had waited for a couple of weeks to say something. Okay. Had you ever heard the name John McCullough? I believe the first time that I heard it was from Agent Shadell. Okay. Have you had any conversations with Bo about John McCullough? Yes. Um, who do you now know John McCullough to be? Uh, it was a friend of his from the Army, okay. um, and that he came home with him for basic, or for Christmas break. Okay. And how, understanding he was a friend who came home with him for Christmas break, what is John McCullough's relationship to this case? Um, he had told the GBI apparently in 2016. And do you know how John McCullough knew um, about Bo helping to burn Terry Grant's dead body. Um, I'm assuming Bo told him, but Bo said that he didn't remember the conversation. Okay. After his arrest, Ryan Duke was thoroughly questioned by investigators. In under two minutes, he had confessed that he was responsible for Tara Grinstead's murder. The interview was by investigators from the GBI, and Ryan had waived his right to a lawyer. The interview, at first, is just audio. I used to break in people's houses just to steal money. I was a drug addict. I, I, I've been drinking, I was high, I don't remember anything clearly, okay. but I was stealing from a purse, and she snuck up on me, and I hear her, I didn't mean to, purely reactionary, but in my brain, I, I mean, I didn't know what else to do, okay. you know, and, uh, the only reason I didn't come forward before, okay. I mean, I just... I can't lie, I can't live with myself, I'm so sick of this stuff. I think there's other people that feel the same way you do, don't you think? No, sir. Okay. I'm tired. And my family's good people, I didn't want to do this to them. Okay. Let's take a breath. You want something to drink? No, sir. Okay. I, I thought about this thing like my world's been loose by a thread, and I've been holding on to that thread for so long.
because of where we're going with this. I'm, I'm, I know you've never been in real major trouble before. I, I understand I'm going to prison. Probably. And I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, to moving forward, I want to make you aware of your rights. I have to. I'll wait longer right to order. Okay. Well, I'm going to read that form to you and let you do that. Yes. But once Ryan began confessing and telling his story, the investigators turned to video to record the interview. Let's back up, okay? You were at the house, you broke in, you said you used a credit card to break into the house. You were digging through her purse, and she surprised you. And you immediately turned around and you pushed her, hit her, now we hit her. I mean, could it be something other than a punch, or like, could it have been like a choking, just scared and fear? You know, that does happen. Is it possible? I'm sure I'm going to start it. Okay. Okay, that's fine. I know the difference. Yes, sir. Okay. So you hit her, and she fell to the ground. Was there any blood or anything? No, but I'm going to look them out. I ran as soon as I got to the house. And then you said, how did you get there? Let's look, I have a hard time looking at them because I've been drinking and I don't make sure we're getting in the Let's go with it. Oh, I'm trying to run this one too. He keeps up his pants and like that. Okay, so he's passed out. Do you remember, was this like after midnight? This is pretty late. It was pretty late. It was like so I had passed out. Do you remember any animals in the house or outside of the house? If you took his truck, you probably drove up there. Do you remember where you parked out or anything again? Just on the same street? I don't even know. And why her? Of all the people, why her? That's my house. the same question. I mean, did you know it was whose house it was before you got here? I don't think so. I mean, if y'all had a relationship or there was something else there, that's okay. She was she had relationships with lots of other people, including other students. That's not a secret. I swear I'm not being, I never had a conversation. Okay. So you, you, you hit her and she fell, and you think that at that point she was probably gone. I won't break. I mean, I... Because you had to go, y'all both went back there and she was still not moving. I swear I went back by myself. Okay. I said she would check her pulse and I wouldn't move. Duke talked to the investigator about what he had done to Tara in her residence. So you go through her purse and do whatever afterwards you go and you pick up her body. Um, you put it, I'm assuming you're just as still in Bo's trunk. And you put it in the back or you put it in the front seat? Then Duke told of wrapping the body up and putting it in the back of his friend's Ford F-150 truck. And down there, and her body's still where you left it, correct? Yes. I was just and then she was out there for a couple of days. So you pick her body up, you uh, pick her body up, put it in your truck, in his truck. Was there a shed out there near the PK or the next wood in it? That was it. Okay. And finally, Duke confessed to what he and his friend had done with the body of Tara Grinstead. On February 23, 2017, during a news conference by the GBI, they announced the arrest from a tip they had received in Tara Grinstead's murder. Ryan Alexander Duke had been charged with murder along with burglary and hiding a body. A few days ago, an individual came forward and reported that they had information in the terror's disappearance. This information made it to my office and our case agent, Jason Shadell, was sent out to conduct an interview. This interview generated several more interviews, which was followed up by the rest of our office here. Through these interviews, enough probable cause was discovered so we could swear out an arrest warrant charging Ryan Alexander Duke with the murder of Tara Grinstead. Duke was taken into custody yesterday afternoon and a warrant was issued this morning. According to arrest documents, Duke broke into Tara's residence, not realizing she was home. When he was going through her things looking for money, she surprised him 
and he strangled her. He then removed the body from the residence. Duke himself said that he broke in through the front door using a credit card, and Tara had caught him going through her purse for money. He panicked and strangled her. Documents stated that Duke then got in touch with his friend, Bo Dukes, about using his Ford F-150 to take the body of Tara to a farm in Ben Hill County, just over 16 miles from Osceola. They would spend two days on that farm, burning the body. During the investigation, DNA was recovered from the latex glove found in Tara's front yard, and it did come back as a match to Ryan Duke. Two days later, Duke recanted his confession. He said his explanation for his involvement in Grinstead's death was not correct, that he had only helped cover up her death. He had not killed her. The trial for Ryan Duke began on May the 9th of 2022. Jurors then watched Ryan's recorded confession, and they also watched the video of him and GBI agent Shodel walk through the pecan orchard searching for where the body had been burned back in 2005. I mean, it kind of had to be open, right, because you were worried about catching fire to the woods? Yes, sir. It was, it was open, but said so it was 10, 15 feet in front of the, at the dirt pad right there. Like I so it's been a decade, though. And you haven't been back out here? No, sir. Uh, it could be. Dr. Alice Gooding, a forensic anthropologist, was called to the stand to talk about the grids and what they found. A grid is a systematic way of going over an area when searching for remains. Dr. Gooding then talked about human bones and the amount that was excavated from the site. The bone fragments were of the skull, spine, and hand. She was also able to tell the bones had been burned. Dr. Gooding confirmed the bones had come from just one victim, that of an adult. 
Then Ryan Duke testified himself. He claimed that Bo Dukes was the one who had murdered Tara Grinstead. You want the jury to believe that you lied and confessed to a murder you didn't commit because you were scared of Bo Dukes, right? I lied and confessed because I did not think Bo would ever tell the truth about what happened, about what he did to her. But you confessed to her murder, right? I did. You could have just told them the truth and they would have still had some semblance of peace, right? I don't know that. It's easy to look at someone from after the fact. You knew they were looking for her every single day. Yes, ma'am. You even say you have nightmares about it, right? Yes, ma'am, I do. But you never went to law enforcement prior to February 22nd. I've stated why. The answer to my question is you never went. No, ma'am. And for every day from October 23rd to February 22nd, you stayed quiet. I did. And you lied every day. You didn't tell people what happened to Tara Grinstead. Yes, ma'am, I did. During the testimony, Ryan described how Bo Dukes disposed of Tara Grinstead's body after the murder. And Bo was on a truck. Where specifically? Where does he walk? He walks around the front of the truck into the clearing. And I'll take a couple steps towards him. And that's when I can I see part of him. And when you say there's a clearing, are you in the, are you around, are the con trees around you? No, sir, it's, it's in the woods. I, I mean, clearing in the woods. No, it was not in the orchard. How far said you saw something or go went? Yes, sir. How far away did they walk away from the truck when you stopped? It was maybe 20 feet, 25. And what specifically, as you're walking towards where Bo is, what specifically do you see? I just remember seeing a, a spot of white. Uh, that was, it was kind of covered up. You say covered up, covered up with what? Uh, leaves and limbs and other, I mean, just, you know, covered up. Debris from the trees? Yes. Pine straw, things like that? Yes. Okay. You walk towards this spot. Can you tell if it's a person at some point? No, sir. Not, not then. Like I said, I just seen something that didn't belong there. When you get, when you get close, when you get closer, are you able to tell whether it's a person? You, you could tell it was, uh, yeah. Was, could you tell if it was a man or a woman? No, sir, not then. Was the person laying on their back or their stomach? They were laying face down. You approach, I guess, do you come to stand near Bo in that area? No, sir, I stopped. Heck yeah. Did you? I, I stopped at the clearing. Uh, I said, as soon as I stopped, so I saw something, I froze where I was. How far away were you standing? Uh, 10, 12 feet. Does Bo do anything once you approach within 10 feet or so? Uh, yes, sir. He reaches down. Uh, he, he grabs your arm and just flips her over. Was it a was it a violent motion they made? Yes, sir. How was the how was the how did he move or how did he turn? It was like I say, he just reached down like you would open a shell door and just you know, crank it on more like this. Does he look at you? Yes, sir. He, he looks at me and says, "I told you." Can you see if the person is wearing clothes? They were wearing clothes. She was wearing clothes. At this point, can you tell if it's a man or woman? Yes, sir. Could you see her face at this point? Somewhat, yes, sir. 
Did you meet people? Were you able to identify who this was at that time? No, sir. If he wouldn't have told me, I wouldn't have known who it was. <clears throat> How was Bo's demeanor at this point when you're back at the body? Yes. <laughs> You know, he's cheerful. You know, he's... Had you ever been to that particular location before? No. So Bo pulls in, does a U-turn, you said. Um, what happens then? When Bo starts to unload the board. Did Bo say anything to me? He told me to get out and help you. Get out of the truck. I did. Did you, did you, did you help him unload the wood? I did. What would y'all do with the wood? You started to kind of stack it, lay it out. Was it near the truck? It wasn't the car. Did you unload the truck, get the wood out? What happens now? What are you doing? I just want to figure out what he, you know, he's thinking about. Him. What happens next? What's your what's your reaction at this point? Uh, a bomb. That's a dry even crying. He's about to say anything. He starts laughing at me. Did you say anything to Bo? I don't think I could say anything at that point. Once the wood's stacked up, what, what do y'all do next? Bo tells me to help him put her on the wood. And did you, <clears throat> did you help him? I did. Move the body? I did. And... Once you place the body on the wood, what happened next? Oh, back out, almost out of the clearing, kind of. You back out like you need to walk back out? Yeah, I told Bo, uh, I can't be here, you gotta take me home. What happened next? He just started putting wood on top of it. And then what happened? He, he lit her on fire. What was his expression, his demeanor, when that happened? It's like he wasn't made. When the two of you get in the truck and leave the orchard, was the fire still burning from the left? I um, didn't look back. I think so. Is this time when you helped move the body onto the the power wood? Was that the last time that you saw Mr. Green State's body? It was. Ryan Duke also testified to an act that Bo Dukes had performed on the deceased body of Tara Grinstead. What happens next? Uh, he gets out of the truck. He tells me to come on because, you know, I'm. I'm just, I'm, I don't know. It's, it was like I was watching myself. I was, was there, but I wasn't. Uh, he, he tells me, come on, get out of the truck. But, uh, that's where he goes back, where she's at. Miss Grant says that. So you get out of the truck, you fall over there? Yes, sir. And... <clears throat> How was Bo's demeanor at this point when you're back at the bottom? Yeah. He was almost excited. You know, he's cheerful. You know, he's... I don't know the right word. You walk back over to the body. Does Bo do anything to the body? He, he tells me to help him pick her up. Did he touch the body or anything before? He did. What did he do? He 
He pushes up her shirt. Starts following her. Did he look at you when he did that? It was like I wasn't there. You know, I, I, I remember telling him to stop. And I remember how he looked at me. You know, it's like I'd never seen him before. How did he look? can't describe it. I don't have the words to describe it. Did you say anything? I, other than to tell him to stop touching her. Did he stop? I think so. Did he, did he cover her back up? Did he pull her shirt back down? No. Nine days after the trial, the jury deliberated for about eight hours, and then a verdict was finally reached. In the Superior Court of Irwin County, Georgia, in the indictment 2017, CR 027, the state of Georgia versus Ryan Alexander Duke, with the jury find the defendant count one, malice murder, not guilty. Count two, felony murder, not guilty. Count three, Felony murder, not guilty. Count four, aggravated assault, not guilty. Count five, burglary, not guilty. Count six, concealing death of another, guilty. And it's signed uh, this day, May 20th, 2022, and signed by the four person. All right, thank you, Ms. Ross. Uh, either side like the jury to be polled. Okay. Next, the judge gave the family a time to step forward and give their impact statement. One that was heart-wrenching came from Connie Grinstead, Tara's stepmother. She spoke on behalf of herself and Tara's father. October 2005 was one of the most painful journeys that I think any family could ever be faced with. There were words that are seared in our memories forever. Missing, disappeared, vanished, and murdered. For over 11 years, we went to bed every night wondering where Tara was, and we woke up every morning with the same question, where is she? We wondered if she was dead or alive. We knew if she was alive, she was being held against her will. And that caused even more anxiety because we knew then she was being abused. Through the years, any time we learned that remains had been found, it was devastating to us as we waited to find out if those remains were Tara's. Some days we even had hope that we might find her alive because that had happened in other cases with young women who had been gone longer than Tara. But there were so many days when the heartache was so great that we could barely even function. Young children in our family were afraid to even go out and play because they thought if somebody took Tara, they might take them too. My elderly mother was so distraught over Tara's disappearance. She sat day after day with her face in her hands because she was worried and upset because we couldn't find Tara. My mother had a stroke and died 28 days after Tara disappeared. The workers in the home where she lived told me that they fully believed the stress of Tara's disappearance brought on that stroke that ended my mother's life in a matter of hours. Tara was reduced from a vibrant, successful, hardworking young woman filled with hopes and dreams. She was reduced to just a few bones and teeth. There was barely enough left of her to even fill a manila envelope. Then after she was murdered, load after load of wood was put on her as they burned her lifeless body. They tried to make sure there would be nothing left of her. What they did to her body after she was murdered spoke volumes to us about what kind of hearts they had. And then even weeks after she was murdered and her body had been burned, they laughed about it at a party. They, 
thought it was funny. What kind of person could do that to another human being? Finally, the judge passed sentence on Ryan Duke. Tara's body was burned, reduced down to mere nothing, down to 20 fragments of bone. Bone so degraded, the official cause of death was undetermined. Ryan Duke was acquitted of murder, but found guilty of concealing the body. 10 years is all he was given. Who was Bo Dukes? By many observations and by those who knew him, he was a braggart and not everything that he said was always the truth, especially if he was drinking or doing drugs. Tall tales and exaggerations were natural for him, especially when he was under the influence. He would say things that people didn't know whether they should believe or not, or just to let him talk. He also had some complicated legal history under his belt. In 2013, he pled guilty to a conspiracy charge involving the U.S. Army and having the Department of Defense property shipped to his home when he lived in Savannah, Georgia. He served time and was supposed to pay restitution and do community service when released from federal prison in 2015. Next, Dukes was indicted in January of 2017 for a sexual assault incident that included forced violation and possession of a weapon during a crime. While out on bond, he allegedly kidnapped and forcibly violated two women on New Year's Day in 2019. He fled the area, which then turned into a massive five-day manhunt. U.S. Marshals were the ones that located him. More to add to the bad history was a girlfriend named Brooke Sheridan. Miss Sheridan said that Bo had confessed to her in January 2017 about his and Ryan Duke's involvement in the Tara Grinstead case. Miss Sheridan then allegedly spoke with the GBI about Bo's confessions to her, apparently turning him in. Then, in March of 2017, he was served arrest warrants for his involvement in the hiding of Tara Grinstead's body. Dukes had only been convicted on the federal theft charge, which he was ordered back to prison for because he had violated the terms of his federal probation. People would wonder how Dukes was out in 2019, committing the aforementioned sexual assault charges and the Tara Grinstead case. There's a two-word legal term known as voluntary surrender. The judge made the decision that Bo Dukes had to go back to federal prison, but that he didn't have to do it immediately. Basically, the judge was going to allow Dukes to report to custody at a later date. This may have been the five days he was on the run. He didn't want to go back to prison. The arrest of Bo Dukes and his involvement in Tara Grinstead's disappearance quickly hit the news networks. While serving time in jail, Bo would appear at the Ryan Duke trial to testify, but instead of testifying, he pled the fifth to avoid incriminating himself. Dukes was previously convicted on charges connected to Tara's death in Wilcox County, but he still had to face additional charges in Ben Hill County. Bo Dukes was on the stand for less than two minutes. Bo Dukes' trial began on March the 19th of 2019. During the trial, one witness on the stand was a cousin, Wes Connor, and another witness was John McCulloch that had been in Army basic training with Bo. Both men testified that he had confessed to them that he did have a part in the crime of Tara Grinstead's death. When John McCulloch took the stand, he spoke of when he had come home with Bo while they were both on leave from basic training. He had said that they had went and recovered the body and they continued to take it to the middle of uh, his grandpa's or the Hudson Pecan Orchard. Uh, the exact location didn't tell me but had made the comment of, you know, we took her to the middle of the pecan orchard and burned her body. And if I can roll back a little bit, whenever I was in basic training, he had made the comment, which now it made sense of the sense of, hey man, it takes more than 1200 degrees to burn human bones. After viewing the tape from Mr. McCulloch's initial interview with the GBI, he took the stand again and broke down. Two photographs, this being states exhibits three and six have been previously introduced into evidence 
Uh, you recognize the person in those photographs? Yes. How's that? I'm from the billboard. It's the person in State Exhibits 3 and 6, the same person that you saw in the billboard. The next four witnesses took the stand and were questioned by the prosecution. One in particular was Bo's Uncle Hudson, who had spoken about the pecan orchards. He spoke of the ongoing problems with Bo, and he also spoke about Bo's carelessness towards others. Well, there were a couple different locations, but uh, in the orchard and then out into a pine planting. Now, with regards to out into the plant, pine planting, uh, what did you notice about that, and, and did you bring that to Bo's attention? Yes, I uh, brought it to Bo's attention for two reasons. Number one, it wasn't supposed to be a fire out there anywhere. And number two, it was built out into built out in an old pine area and could have burned off these pine trees. And did you say something to Bo about that? Yes, I spoke in a way that no uncle should ever speak to a nephew. And um, with regards to that, what, what did you tell him? And I mean, you, you, if you want to give me your exact words, that's fine. But what, what, what was it that you told him? I said, keep your ass out of these woods. Or I'm on, I'm on hurt you. Okay. And wh why was it that you told him that? That was because he's typical Bo. All his life, he just didn't listen, and uh, you know, he could have done a lot of harm. During the trial, the tape of Bo's confession was seen by the jury. He was basically turning the story around on Ryan Duke by saying his supposed friend had accidentally killed Tara and that he had asked for Bo's help to get rid of the body. Both men had turned on each other. Brooke Sheridan took the stand and talked about Bo's confession to her as she had done with the GBI detective, Jason Schaudel. There were texts that had been found from a conversation between Bo Dukes and GBI detective Schaudel. Had Bo and Schaudel been talking prior to February of 2017? If so, it would go against what Brooke had been saying. Was she lying? Had she made up the story to get her hands on the reward money? More evidence shown to the jury were some odd texts from Bo Dukes to an unknown friend talking about the murder. 
Had Bo made a deal in the case? Was he turning on Ryan Duke the way Ryan had turned on him? The trial lasted for four days. The jury deliberated for less than an hour before returning their verdict. Bo Dukes was convicted of concealing Tara Grinstead's death and was sentenced to 25 years in prison, after which his sentence was handed down. I'm thankful for this opportunity to address the court. This is the Tara Grinstead family. I'm truly sorry. Your long suffering has been unimaginable. My actions are cowardly, callous, and cruel. I was more interested in self-pity and self-conservation than doing the right thing for Tara and for you. I pray for your forgiveness. The body was never found, but investigators say the limited remains, the bone fragments they had discovered, did belong to Tara. Another institution said that the body was too badly burned and that just the fragments were found. What they had wasn't enough to be able to collect DNA due to the degradation, where they could positively confirm that it was the remains of Tara Grimstead. No further updates have appeared at this time concerning the fates of Ryan Duke and Bo Dukes. Regardless of what their fates may be, it will never be the fate of Tara Grinstead. Hers is final. Her life was taken by two individuals that never had a second thought past the first thought of getting some money to get high and passing out. Still, questions remain. There was no forced entry. Did she know her killer or just let the person in? Her car was unlocked, yet it was said that she never did that. Had someone else been in the car? Someone much bigger that had to move the seat back? And where had the car been when witnesses say it was gone for a time and then placed back in the carport with dirty tires? Why hadn't the dog alerted to a stranger? Dolly was outside in the fenced backyard. Did the dog know the killer and was just wagging her tail instead? No suspects have been convicted for the murder of Tara Grinstead. Is there someone still out there that no one knows about? Or is one of the two behind bars waiting to walk free from the murder of Tara? Will there ever be an answer? Will there ever be peace for the family? Most importantly, will there ever be justice for Tara? If you find this video compelling, you might want to watch these other similar videos.